thank you for that beautiful music and a good Martin Luther King Jr. day and weekend to each of you. You know, growing up Unitarian Universalist, this day has always been an important part of the sacred liturgical calendar for, for me. And on sacred days, we tell sacred stories to remind us of where we are coming from and who we strive to be. And this story comes from one of the sources of wisdom, our six sources of Unitarian Universalism, the words and deeds of prophetic people. And a few of you may know it backwards and forwards, and a few might be hearing it for the first time. And yet when I went back to, to read this story, it's one of our spirit place stories we used to tell in person, I was really struck by how differently I'm hearing it, um, having lived through the time of COVID and, and racial justice protests uh, that, that are really rocking the world. And I hope no matter how you relate to this story that you can find something new in it today to inspire you in your own life's work for a better world. In 1954, a young man named Martin Luther King Jr. became the new minister at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. He preached nonviolence as a way to change things that are violent and unfair. Dr. King's congregation was an all African American congregation in the south of the US during the time of segregation. Segregation was a system that used laws and violence to put down black people by keeping them out of many spaces where white folks were in order to keep powerful white leaders in power. Places like libraries, schools, places to eat, places where you can find opportunity. Many African Americans in Montgomery were fighting against segregation, in part by joining the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And then on December 1st, 1955, something happened that changed Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and American history. You see, the way the bus system worked was that white people would sit in the front, black people would sit in the back, and there was a place in the middle where black people sat until a white person asked for the seat. And if they asked for the seat, that person had to move. Let me say that again, they had to move. I wonder how does that make you feel? You know, Dr. King, when he was a, a, little, a little boy, he still remembered the, the, the feeling of humiliation and anger at the unjust injustice of these, these moments like that, when somebody would ask him to get up and go somewhere else. Well, Rosa Parks, right here, she refused to give up her seat on a bus to a white person. Now, many of us know this story of Rosa Parks, a seamstress who was tired or fed up after a long day of work. What a lot of people don't know is that Rosa Parks was not just tired. She was a longtime activist, lover of her community, dedicated to the cause of social justice. She had gone to trainings in nonviolent protest, so she was prepared, she was ready for this moment. And more importantly, even than that, her community, people were ready to support her. This was not her first time refusing to give up her seat to a white person on a bus. It's just the first time that she was arrested. And in fact, other African American community members had also been arrested for refusing to go along with segregation. This time, leaders in the African American community decided the time was right to organize to support Rosa Parks and to make a push to demonstrate against this unfair system. This is Rosa Parks getting arrested. Well, leaders called a boycott against the bus community. Boycott, refusing to pay the company, refusing to pay to ride the bus when black folks were not being treated equally. They decided to run that for one day, and a group of political activist women stayed up late to make thousands and thousands of flyers at the local university. I remember hearing a story that said that they were using using the 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 way to duplicate these, and they were they were using that resource of the local university, um, and they were hoping that they could get it done in time. This is a real copy of the flyer. Now, these organizers were hoping that half or more of the black community of Montgomery would refuse to ride the buses for that one day. You've got to know that most black people in Montgomery at the time needed those buses to get to work because hardly anybody had cars. 
So Monday morning of the boycott, the organizers were standing at a bus stop watching and really hoping that the boycott would be a success. They weren't sure. Could people do it? And then they saw empty bus after empty bus rolling by, some with just a few white passengers in them. And they were amazed. It turned out that almost all of the black community of Montgomery participated in that boycott. That's 40,000 people. By the way, 60,000 people live in Lancaster City, to give you an idea of how many people participated in this. Some cities would find it hard to organize 40,000 people in two days, but a lot of people in the black community of Montgomery were already used to talking about political issues and working for equality. And with such success, leaders met to discuss what to do next. And Dr. Martin Luther King, that young preacher who was new to living in Montgomery, was elected the president of the new group to keep the boycott going. And in fact, an elderly friend of the family says that uh, part of the reason that he was elected was because he was new to Montgomery, and it was a very, very risky thing to be the, the public face of such a boycott. And they did keep it going. But it's hard to keep up a boycott like this. Thousands of people walked and walked and walked to work, to school, to home, to church. Empty buses kept rolling by. Some walked as far as 20 miles each day. 20 miles. Here's a group of folks walking. What does it look like they're feeling? Participating in their own liberation. Now I want you to guess. How long do you think that this lasted? Walking miles and miles everywhere. Guess how long this might have lasted. Here's a calendar. December 1955, maybe a week. Can they keep it going a week? Maybe they kept it going a month. Through the winter snow, the slush, the sleet. Kept going more. People gave each other rides to work. They organized carpools so that people wouldn't have to depend on the bus system. They kept their energy going with mass meetings in churches, even in the hot Alabama summer. They listened to Martin Luther King and other ministers give inspiring speeches. And they sang music to keep themselves walking, keep on going, to keep seeking out more love. Did they keep it going? All the way for over a year, they walked. And I don't know about you, but I look at this calendar a little bit differently than I did in January of 2020, which is I think the last time I told this spirit, this spirit play story. You know, it was hard for the leaders too. Rosa Parks, she lost her job. People harassed her, people sent her death threats, but she kept going. Her experience, her activism in the NAACP had prepared her for this moment. And some people from the white community who wanted the boycott to end made bombs and attacked the homes of some of the leaders. Martin Luther King Jr.'s home was attacked one night, him and his family. But he and the others asked everyone to keep going, to not be afraid, and to not fight back with their guns, but to stand up for their rights using the power of protest, because they knew that that would be effective. Martin Luther King Jr. was also arrested during this boycott. There were lawyers from the black community helping fight this unfair law while the people on the ground boycotted the buses. And finally, after months and months of walking, came the news that the U.S. Supreme Court had declared segregation on buses was against the Constitution, not allowed. So all across the U.S., all across the U.S., not just in Montgomery, African Americans would no longer have to sit in the back of the bus or give up seats to anyone. This was part of the struggle for full opportunity, for dignity, for honoring of their inherent worth and dignity, and the, for the right to have a voice in their own communities. These are principles that are dear to us as Unitarian Universalists. And many people celebrated the victory that they had hard won. 
I wonder, how is it that they could keep going for so long? I wonder if there's any part of this story that surprises you. I wonder how this story relates to us right here, right now, today.